Today I'd like to share the grace of God with the title, Noah Who Found Grace in God's Eyes. Our opening scriptures today is taken from Matthew 24, verse 37 to 39, and Luke chapter 17, verse 26 to verse 30. I'll read it for you. Matthew 24, 37 to 39. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Luke chapter 17, verse 26 to verse 30. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it shall be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying. They were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Our opening scriptures is a verse that we all know so well, right? And I remember reading this verse um, before I was married. And I was going to Seoul, so I brought this guy whom I was planning to marry to meet our former senior pastor so that he could pray and bless the marriage for us. But I came across this verse, and when I read it, I panicked and I called it off, you know, because I did not want to be one of those people who were marrying in the end times, right? (laughs) That's what I thought. So I thought, you know, I had enough spiritual battles every day in my life. I didn't want to add another problem to my life. So do you, like me, have spiritual battles every day? If you do, do you know why we have spiritual battles with Satan every day? Because we don't really realize it's the end time. You know, we know it in our head, right? We say it is the end time. But if we actually, truly believe that it is the end time, then we wouldn't be having the spiritual battles because we wouldn't even be tempted. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 to 39, says they were drinking and eating and marrying and so on. So this doesn't mean that in the end time, all of us have to be single or, and then all of us have to starve to death. That's not what it means, right? But these are all the fleshly and worldly desires that are inside us. Eating and drinking is like partying. Marrying is focusing or being fixated on the opposite sex. And then in Luke, it says buying, selling, planting, building. So this is working, right? Because back then they were farmers, so they plant. And... Isn't this actually what we do every day, right? We eat and drink, we meet our friends and party, and then we do business, we do our business to take care of our home and family. So are we all doomed? These are the worldly things that worldly people chase after and enjoy. It doesn't mean that we cannot do these things or that it is a sin, but we need to know how to prioritize the spiritual things, and we need to know the purpose of why we are doing these things. If we do not understand the word, then we'll be busy just doing all these meaningless things that couldn't even save our souls. Matthew 24 verse 39 says, And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So we have studied in the first book of the History of Redemption series, the Genesis genealogies, that Noah preached to the people to enter the ark. And this means that they have heard the word of God, right? But this is just like the sermon that we heard on Harvest Day, if you remember, Pastor Samuel preached. It is not how many times we heard the word, but it is when did that word really come alive in you? When did that word make us have a turning point in our life? When did we actually understand that word? The people in Noah's time 
did not understand, even though they heard it many times. If they did, then they would be helping Noah to build the ark, right? Or they would already be inside the ark before the flood came. Enoch was 65 years old when he finally realized that the end was near, and he started walking with God. And that was why his son's name was Methuselah, right? Which means the end time. So, have we truly realized that the end is near and the Lord is coming to judge everyone according to their deeds? Have we made the changes that pleases God? Walking with God even though we're in the office, doing business, or at home? If so, then it means that we are truly glorifying Jesus in our life. But reality is that most of us fall short. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 tells us that we all fall short of the glory of God. Why do we fall short of the glory of God? Why do we feel guilty in our life of faith? Because of the constant battle between the spiritual world and the physical, fleshly desires that we have inside us. Eating, drinking, having fun, getting married, wanting that life you dreamt about, you know, your worldly goals in life. Again, I'm saying, you know, I repeat myself that I'm not saying that you don't have to work, that you don't have to have goals in your life. We need all these things too, so that we can survive in this world, right? But the point is that this all turns into greed and idolism if it is not connected to God. So it needs to be connected to God and his redemptive work. For example, the person you want to marry, the Mr. Right or Mrs. Right, you know, I know everybody has their own Mr. or Mrs. Right in their mind, right? Your standards. He has to be good looking. He has to have six packs. He has to be rich. He has to be nice and also generous. But are those criteria in line with God? So what is God's criteria for you? Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 tells us, Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So God does not restrict marriage, right? God agrees that we need to get married. That's good. But married to whom? Someone compatible, the helper. So is this in our criteria? Helper here doesn't mean someone to help you clean your house and wash your dishes, right? The Holy Spirit is also called the helper. Holy Spirit helps us to understand the word of God, comforts us, protects us, and guides us. So this helper is someone suitable for you, someone who will help you achieve your goal in life. So what should my goal in life be? It needs to be connected to God. Everything God wants for us is in line in his work of redemption. For example, if Adam was a pastor, right, it would be best he married a church worker who would understand his work and who would support him instead of yelling at him to make money and, you know, go buy her a Hermes bag or a diamond ring. Pastor Adam would need someone to remind him, hey, you haven't read the Bible today. You know, stop complaining. Just pray to God. Trust God, and he will answer your prayers. Stop watching the TV so much. So that would be Mrs. Wright for Adam. But if his wife was worldly and greedy, then Adam could just fall, like what happened in the Garden of Eden, right? Because Eve wanted what she shouldn't have, and that's why the fall came. We all need to become the recovered Adam and Eve, and we need to recover the Garden of Eden. If the world is ending tomorrow, if, right, would all the goals and dreams and desires that we have right now, would it mean anything anymore? Unless they are in line with God, they will all be meaningless and a waste of our time. So think about it. 
If we want to transfigure and go to heaven like Enoch, means we have to live every day as if it is the last day. Right? Even if it's not the last day, just to live as though it is the last day. And that was how Enoch walked with God. But the people of the world, they say, you know, this world is going to last another thousand years at least. Right? And then they say, you know, just enjoy your life. You can always repent later. And the sun is still shining brightly. It's not going to end. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to 4 says, Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. So the Bible warns us of people like this. And nowadays, you know, even if we mention the word end time, it's so sensitive. You know, people look at us negatively and they think we are crazy. Like Pastor Samuel said, even if the world doesn't end, our life has a limited time too, right? So the remaining time that God has given us is so very precious. Every second is precious. What do we use our time for? When we don't use it for the right things, that is when we have that spiritual guilt in us and the battle inside. If the world is ending tomorrow, would our hurt or sadness or anger, hatred, would that all mean anything? Would that even save us? It would all be meaningless. So we should not live the remaining of our life for meaningless things like this. If we truly believe that the time is near and the Lord will return, then what would be important to us right now? Or what will we be doing in our spare time? We need to think about this deeply. And I know everybody knows the answer. Even if we serve in the church, but if we do it and still have all the fleshly thoughts and desires, all the negative emotions, then sooner or later, even coming to church, the church duties that we need to do, all will slowly become a burden. And without realizing it, we will slowly forget why we came to church in the first place. So we need to question ourselves. Do we honestly, truly believe we are living in the end of the end times? Do we truly believe Christ will return? Because how can we face him if we are constantly losing to Satan? If we are constantly being that adulterous, unfaithful bride? Last Lord's Day, we learned that we are that bride, the new Jerusalem that is adorned for Christ. That is why Jesus said, the time of the Son of Man will be like the time of Noah. And so let us embark into the study of Noah so that we would not be those drowning in the sea, but we would be those who are saved in the ark. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with men forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they brought children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made men on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy men whom I have created from the face of the earth, both men and beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. So when we study the Genesis genealogies, we know that from Adam until the time of Noah is 1,056 years, 1056. And you can see in Genesis chapter 5 that Noah is the 10th generation from Adam. 
And when Noah was 600 years old, the flood came. So 1,656 years after Adam, right? So this 1,656 long years are full of God's tears. God was filled with exasperation, frustrations, and constant worries during these 1,656 years. The sin that descended from Cain's uh, descendants made everything rotten and corrupted. And sin was in every corner of the earth. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 tells us that men's heart were extremely wicked and their intent and their thoughts were continually evil. Then in Genesis chapter 6 verse 6 it says, it says, And the Lord was sorry that he had made men on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. God was grieved in his heart. He was so grieved that he could not breathe. God did not judge humans because he was bored, but because there is a reason. If not, he would not have brought judgment. But the Bible tells us in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, that God will not do anything unless he reveals it first to his servants. So we can be prepared because God gives a warning to his people. That judgment of the flood came to everybody, even to Noah. But because Noah believed in God's judgment, in his word, he believed in God's words, so he was able to be saved. But the rest of the world became condemned through his belief. Hebrew 11 verse 7 says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. <clears throat> So here it says that Noah condemned the world, right? What does this mean? It means that Noah became the standard of judgment. So unless they believed as Noah did, they would not be able to enter the ark. Being the standard, you know, to make it easier for all of us to understand, is like God saying, Noah could believe, so why couldn't you? Right? If no one could believe at all, zero, nobody believed at all, then God couldn't judge the world. But there was someone who could believe. It was Noah. And he's human, just like you. So if he could believe, why couldn't you? So I pray that all of us can become like Noah, who believed in God's judgment and become the standard of judgment. It's better to be the standard than to be those people trying to follow the standard, right? Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 to 10 and verse 13 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And, Noah said, and God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So in a world that was full of darkness, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a just man and perfect in his generation. And he, like he, Enoch, walked with God. So during that time, these two people, Enoch and Noah, were so precious in God's eyes. Revelation 21 verse 1 says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. So why, why was there a new heaven and a new earth? Because the first ones had passed away. So this is talking about the end time, right? Genesis chapter 5 Verse 22 to 24 shows us Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Enoch had had wife and he had a lot of children, right? So I'm sure that sometimes he also had problems with his wife, 
and problems with his children. Yet his faith and his belief in God made God so happy that God took him. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, testimony that he pleased God. So here tells us that Enoch did not die, but was transfigured. Why? John chapter 8 verse 29 says, And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. So this is the reason why Enoch was taken. When we always do things that pleases the Father, God will not leave us alone. God will always be with us, and God will protect us. Hebrew chapter 11 verse 5 clearly shows us that Enoch pleased God. He did not die, but he was transfigured, body and soul alive, and he was taken up because he pleased God. We easily say that, all things are possible with faith, right? But Enoch, with faith, did not die. We live in a sinful world that is overflowing with sins. So, but we should have faith just like Enoch. Enoch did not die because he who sent me is with me. Enoch walked with God, meaning he was with God. And this makes God feel the happiest. Therefore, God could not let Enoch die. You know, the end of a needle, it's really sharp, right? And it's very small. But Enoch had no holes in his faith, not even the size of a needle point. So our faith must also not have any holes, no blemish, no doubts. If there's even a tiny hole, then Satan can come in and eventually he will kill us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 says, Nor give place to the devil. Enoch was a human being, just like us. So we have the same body as Enoch. So we must also have the same faith as he does. Enoch saw the end time, and he believed, and he evangelized. Jude chapter 1, verse 14 says, Now Enoch... The seven from Adam prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. It says the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. So this is referring to the end time, right? Enoch already saw the end time. It was not in his time, but he saw it, and he had godly fear, and he walked with God. Noah was the same. God warned Noah about the flood. And Noah already saw the rain, even though it wasn't raining. Every day, Noah saw the rain. We need those eyes. Those eyes that can see the end every day, so that all of us can also walk with God like they did. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, I will read this again. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. So Noah had received a warning. When God told him to build the ark, he immediately obeyed God. He did everything God told him to, even if it did not make sense. He never questioned God. He just did everything, all of it. This is written in Genesis 6, verse 22, and Genesis chapter 7, verse 5. So what about us? Do we obey every word of God that we hear or we read? Or do we only obey the parts that we like, and then we just forget about the parts that we don't like or we can't do yet, we think? I mean... Sometimes, you know, what God tells us to do doesn't even make sense, right? Did it make sense to build an ark on a mountain where it did not even rain yet? Or when God told Noah to enter seven days before the flood, do you think that was easy? If God told us to enter the ark 
seven days before the flood, what are you going to do? In human thoughts, you would think, you know, what am I going to do in this ark for seven days, right? It's a whole week. I would be doing nothing. So let's say your son who went to school abroad is returning. Is returning tonight, you know, after four years of not seeing him. You would be crying out to God, right? You would be saying, God, you know, the flood is not till a week later. So, you know, just let me go to the airport first, pick up my son, and then I'll come back and I'll obey everything you say. Or you'll say, oh, let me clear my family matters first. And then five days later, I'll come back before the flood. But God says, now, enter the ark now. How would you digest that? Think about it. Can you obey? Would you obey? And it's not like you just have to wait one day in the ark, but you are there for seven days. What man's thoughts would enter into your head? If God says to enter now, then God would be responsible and take care of your family matters. God would take care of your son who is arriving, you know. God would take care of the problem. But the problem is that you want to take care of it yourself. We humans are like this. Without the faith of Noah, we would not be able to obey. So why seven days? What is the secret that God is telling us? No matter how we squeeze our brains, we would not be able to understand. Even Jesus Christ said, to the man who wanted to bury his son, he said, let the dead bury the dead. You are alive, so you follow me. You know? Who would follow a religion like this? Right? His father just died. And this is Jesus saying, he's already dead. So you just follow me. If you think about it, isn't it ridiculous? This is something so difficult to understand or to digest, much less to obey. Genesis chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8 are filled with a lot of hidden mysteries, with spiritual meanings. God hides his work of salvation so that Satan would not know. But God said that the spirit who is from God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has an inner relationship with God, And it knows. So the Holy Spirit will teach you. So we need to receive this Holy Spirit. And we need to receive God's teachings. Reference verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 to 12. But let's just read verse 10 to 11. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So without the Holy Spirit, we would not know about God's work. Proverbs 20 verse 27 says, The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. We must be God's lamp in this dark and sinful world. We should receive the blessings of walking with God at all times and overcome the sinful world, and we need to change our hearts. When our heart becomes corrupted, this results in judgment. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So we need to first understand why God created Adam. When God first created mankind, God gave a command that they should multiply. That is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. It says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. But here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it's talking about mankind created in God's image. 
Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 tells us that we were created in God's image. Then in verse 28, they were told to multiply. So God wants the people with the image of God to multiply and fill the earth. And we see in Genesis chapter 6 verse 1 that men did multiply. Genesis 6 verse 1 says, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. But what kind of men were they? Seth's descendants or Cain's descendants? They were Cain's descendants, and they multiplied and bore daughters. Isn't it weird that they only bore daughters and not sons? You know, in Korea, there's a saying that the woman is like the field and the man is the seed. But physically speaking, men do carry the seed, right? And that is why women can have babies. But in the Bible, seed is the word of God in Luke chapter 8, verse 11. So sons have seed, but daughters do not have the seed. Especially in the context of Genesis chapter 6 itself, it is clear that the daughters mentioned represent people who do not have the word of God, in contrast to those who had God's word and God's covenant. Then in Genesis chapter 6 verse 2, it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they choose. The sons of God here are the descendants of Seth, those with the word of God, who held on to God's covenant. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after the fall of Adam and Eve, God gave them the hope of redemption through the promised seed, the seed of the woman, the Messiah. So the line of Seth was a line that held on to this covenant, a line where Christ will be born. Excuse me. So this was a line that was connected to God. When we study the meanings of each name in Seth's lineage, we know that God was in the center of their life. An example is Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. It says, And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. So men began to call on the name of the Lord means they started to develop a personal relationship with God. So they cry out to God, they started to pray and to worship him. So we can see that Seth's descendants followed God's covenant and God's will. If you have read the Genesis genealogies, you would also know that there was also the line of Cain. The line of Cain was a line that held onto the more worldly things in life. And we can know this because in Genesis chapter 4, from the Hebrew words used in that passage, it tells us that his descendants were successful traders. They were famous for making weapons, made uh, musical instruments, but for sensual pleasure. And the first polygamist, who was also a murderer, is also there. These descendants, like their forefather Cain, lived according to the flesh and rejected God and his word. So that was in Genesis chapter 4 and Genesis chapter 5. And then we see these two lineages, right, from these two chapters. And the problem appears in Genesis chapter 6, a problem that was most feared. The holy lineage where Christ was to be born gets infiltrated by Satan through marriage. The lineage of disobedience and sinfulness overpowered and influenced the lineage of the covenant to turn them away from the word and cause them to participate in the sinful ways of life. So throughout the Bible, we see this problem happening, right? So God kept reminding the Israelites, do not marry the Gentiles. But the sons of God were drawn to these daughters of men. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 19 says, You shall keep my statutes. 
You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. You shall not sow your field with mixed seeds. Nor shall a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. So even in the law, God said not to mix the seeds. This is spiritually telling us not to mix the holy seed with the unholy seed. I don't think God was worried about farming, right? Then during Ezra's time, the priest who was supposed to be the example for the children of Israel was tainted because they married the non-believers. Ezra chapter 9 verse 2 says, For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the people of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. So likewise, this happened in Genesis chapter 6. Seth's descendants also married the daughters of the world. And this resulted in the mixed breed as their descendants. So we need wisdom to be able to understand these verses. Earlier in my introduction, I spoke about how in Lot's time, they were busy marrying and being given in marriage. And God does not disapprove marrying, right? In fact, God says it is good because it's not good for Adam to be alone. But God says that Adam needs a helper comparable to him. So even in marriage, it needs to be connected to God. But Genesis chapter 6 verse 2 says, they took wives for themselves, all whom they chose. So it's not whom God chose, but whom they chose. So what happened here is that the God's children and the children of the world got married. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 tells us the result of the marriage. It says there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of all men of renown. So these were their children, mighty men. Genesis chapter 10 describes a man named Nimrod as the first mighty man. Genesis 10 verse 8 to 10 says, Cush begat, begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Iraq, Akkad, and Kalneh in the land of Shinar. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So although Nimrod was called a mighty hunter before the Lord, but actually, this means he was brave in challenging God and skillful at standing against God's will. Mighty one is gibor in Hebrew, and it generally means one who rules violently or who is a tyrant. Genesis chapter 6 verse 11 says, The earth was, so, was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Nimrod was a mighty one on the earth. He built the Tower of Babel. And we all know that God was really upset with that, right? So we can imagine what kind of children were born in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Then when we read on Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. However, many people say that Genesis chapter 6 verse 2 are angels marrying men's daughters. Why? Because they say the term sons of God are the angels. And I will show you some verses that they use to prove this. Job chapter 1 verse 6 now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And then in Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And then also Jude chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, 
and the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved the everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So through these verses, a lot of people thought that the sons of God here are angels. But truly, creation is not like this. It was only after Adam, then there was male and female relationship. Would angels come and rape human women? If it happened then, it should still be happening now, right? But the Bible also calls believers as sons of God. So we Christians are all sons of God too. Let's read Hosea chapter 1 verse 10. It says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. So angels do not marry. If it were angels who marry human women, then why did God judge men in the earth? God should have judged the angels instead, right? When we read the context you know, of the chapter, it's about men who God created to be his sons and to do his work. But these men became corrupt in sins and wickedness. And that was why God said he was sorry that he made men on the earth in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6. Even Jesus said, angels do not marry. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, I'll read it. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So when you read the book of Jude, don't read it literally. What we must know is the fall and salvation of Adam through angels. The descendants of Cain and Seth is totally divided. There is this big difference, you know. It has to be clear. The faithful Christians are called God's children. The work of salvation will be recovered by or through Seth's descendants, as we can see in Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. When we study the Genesis genealogies, we can see that Seth's descendants live their lives connected to God. But Cain's descendants go after wealth, fame, beauty, and the more worldly things. In John chapter 2, verse 15 to 16, warns us, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not with him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. These are the corrupted ones. When the seeds is mixed, it gets corrupted. And that is why God said in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God created Adam, God breathed the breath of life into him. So we know that the breath of life here is the Spirit of God. And as reference verse, it's John chapter 20, verse 22. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 is saying that God is taking back his spirit that he gave to men. Then in Genesis chapter 6, verse 6, God says, And the Lord was sorry that he had made men on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The word sorry in other translation is regret. So sorry or regret in Hebrew is yinahem, and from the root word naham. It has a few different meanings like to have compassion, to feel pity, or to repent, and so on. But when God feels sorry, it's like, number one, panting, breathing um, strongly. <clears throat> 
When your children made you worry, did you pant like God? Panting shows God's overflowing, generous love. And then secondly, it's like wrestling. You know how you feel like you're wrestling inside your heart? God loves us this much. So when you say things like, oh, it's because of that girl that I'm so upset, that kind of sadness, sadness is nothing compared to the regret and sorry and worry that God feels. God sighs and worries and says, you know, I created these children, but why are they living in so much sins? Why are they trying to kill themselves? God is a just God, and that's why he's always wrestling. Thirdly, it's like suffocating. You know, when you feel so worried and so sad that you cannot breathe, you know, like when you have an anxiety attack. In Hebrew, it's naham. It is the type of heart that gives out a big sigh, whether it's for other people's pain or for your own pain. So it means that the spirit is breaking It's like how our heart is breaking. God feels as if his heart is just being torn when we give him so much pain. During the time of Noah, God's heart was really in pain because of all the corruption that was going on. So what is this teaching us? Let us not be the ones to fall into temptation in this world with ungodly deeds that cause our God to sigh, to be heartbroken, and to constantly worry for us. But let us become like Noah, who is pleasing in God's eyes, obeying all of God's words, and always walking with God. When we believe like Noah, God will see us, and God will work through us, through our family, and also through our church. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the word of God. Father God, we want to become like Noah. We want to become like Enoch, who is able to walk with you every day. Father God, please give us the eyes that is able to see the end every day of our life. Help us to be able to live our life as if it is the last day we have. Father God, help us to also believe that you will return Heavenly Father, we pray that you will use each and every one of us so that we are able to fulfill your work of redemption. Help us to become your tools to evangelize, to proclaim your words, whether it be through our deeds or through our words, so that when others see us or hear us, they will be able to be saved. Thank you, Father Lord, for this word. We lift up this prayer in the holy name of our Lord Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Let us give glory to God.